It's thrilling for someone like me to see each new Hanukkah picture because I am lost in it. I am dropped off a steep, steep cliff and set adrift in an ocean of ideas and emotions. It surrounds me. It awes me because I lack the big intellectual frameworks to wrap around it and restrain it into something like a respectable work of art. Just another exhibit. No, to me, watching Hanukkah is like putting on the Sex Pistols Anarchy in the UK when I was 14 and turning that shit up loud. Hanukkah shakes you up. He destroys your conception of what a film is supposed to be. His moves are calculated, explosive, and utterly devastating. I picture Haneke walking away from Hollywood with a trail of petrol in his wake and a match. yippee ki motherfuckers. Haneke is the subject of a million film school essays right now, and I don't give a rat's ass about any of them. To get all arty film school about the guy, to try and put a leash on the wild dog and put conventions around him seems perverse to me. To be in a position where I could stroke my bearded chin and tell you all about where Haneke gets the grist for the mill would feel sad and empty. Mystery lives in the gaps in our understanding, and I like to take Haneke in as an enigmatic force of nature. Maybe I'd be less impressed for knowing where the stitches are, or maybe more. What I know is that watching his films thrills me precisely because I don't have easy pigeonholes to drop him into. Somebody much smarter than me can tell you all about where he cribbed his style from or whom he is paying homage to in a scene, whatever the fuck. I'm just sharing what I get out of his work as a dope-addled lover of trash cinema. I'll wait for someone wiser to tell me I'm doing it all wrong and make that jerk-off gesture with my hand the whole time they're talking. This will probably happen over tapas or something like that, and I'll have drunk too much of the wine I don't understand and don't appreciate properly, too. But with the more, Hanukkah is tasked with telling the story of a husband and wife who are entering old age and breaking down accordingly. What happens when George has to attend to his wife Anne as she is dying? Lesser filmmakers, which means fucking everybody except Hanukkah, would fuck this up horribly. We'd have this sassy home care nurse who works with George and Anne and keeps their spirits up. Lessons about what life is about and what it all means, as flippant, as irrelevant as any Oprah-level sentiment would be on every page. There would be a bucket list and hilariously touching montages of Anne skydiving or taking sailing lessons or some bullshit. Anne would drift off into oblivion after giving some words of strength and assurance to her beloved George, and she'd look lovely and all made up while expiring peacefully and with dignity. Hanake says fuck all that, and gives us an unflinching portrait of what it really means to fulfill those vows until death to us part. It's a beautiful, meditative piece that never tries to give us any garbage metaphysics or to tart up the process of death into this melodramatic struggle for life or whatever half-cock nonsense Hollywood would cook up. What we get is just a real look at a beautiful commitment to care for someone no matter what. There is little focus on the specifics of the lives of George and Anne. We know she was a piano instructor of some renown, for example, but the story never hinges on anything about them in particular, save a desire not to be relegated to a care home and left to rot away among strangers. Thus, with a promise to Anne, George sets the rest of the story in motion. There is so much humanity in this film, so much beautiful solidarity and vulnerability between people. If there is an Oprah message here, it's really that love means having to endure the indignities of illness and old age and no matter how well we feel we may know our chosen life partners there will remain things to be seen and to learn about each other right up until the last moment is it life affirming no, you could watch it that way what it really is however is just human this is no fairy tale about death and marital commitment this is the real deal with all the banalities laid bare. Frankly, it's the banalities which make this portrayal so real to me. Like all of Haneke, this film is essential uh, if you care at all about important filmmaking. Once upon a time, I tried to get an interview with Haneke. We were considering a feature piece on Funny Games for Fangoria. His French handlers were very kind, but ultimately declined as he was very busy doing press for Amour. It will always be a huge missed opportunity for me as I was going to make the case for Funny Games as a horror movie. Uh, really the best horror movie in terms of showing real horror, I think. 
It wasn't to be, however, and that's just hell. Genre purists who see it as their duty to enforce horror orthodoxy would have flipped their shit and cried great buttery tears over daring to put a true master of cinema on the cover. It might have been too harsh a reminder how stagnant the genre is, thanks in no small part to the thought police that haunt every letters to the editor section and every internet forum. You blew it up, you maniacs. Damn you all to hell. Hey, thanks a lot, Dave. That was really beautiful, man. And, you know, it's really hard uh, to <clears throat> to sit here and try to figure out Michael Haneke, you know, as a filmmaker. I know everyone had just li- has just listened to, uh, you know, our our show on Stanley Kubrick, and, and then we bounce right back, and now we're dealing <laughs> with, yeah. with Michael Haneke. But what I like what I like about your your uh, little piece there, Dave, is that you know you you take Michael Haneke and you you separate him from from just about everyone else you know on the planet, like every filmmaker on the planet, and that's pretty special. And there's no doubt about it that what this man has accomplished over the past 20 years. Uh, and keep in mind, he worked in television until he was uh, in his mid-40s, and then he <clears throat> started making feature films, the first one being uh, The Seventh Continent, which is just uh, really uh, a bizarre piece. I mean, you're talking about a family, you know, ba- basically the first 40 minutes of The Seventh Continent is a family, like, having dinner, and they appear, like, very normal, and uh, life just seems okay, and then the second half of the movie is them just like destroying like everything that they own in their house <laughs> and all, uh, eventually, you know, ending their lives. And nothing is explained. <laughs> nothing is spoiler is alert figured out. Oh, stop, Billy. Please. I mean, it's I, I haven't seen that one, it's my, <laughs> but it's in so, it's so I guess I can skip it. It's in it's in the. It's not a it's not a surprise. I mean, you you could read it on the back of the DVD. I mean, it, it's doesn't, not... it doesn't matter if you know the ending, Billy. As you well know, you're, you're, you're being a little bit, you're being coy, I think, a little bit here. But obviously, you know, it doesn't matter if you know what the ending of a Hanukkah film is. You know what I mean? It, the like the whole, the joy is, you know, watching the film and, yeah, and you know, the... yeah, sure, and, sure. And that's, <laughs> Dave, you know, like I said, you separate Hanukkah from from just about everyone else, and that's well deserved because. Uh, as far as this piece is concerned, I'm more. I mean, there's there's no there's no one that would make it like this, right? I mean, there's it, no one, no one that well, I'm aware of. Well, that's the thing, right? I mean, the guy is a he is he's a force of nature. He's a singular filmmaker, right? What, what he's doing, like it or not, you know, love it or hate it, he's doing exactly what he wants to do, and there's nobody else who's really doing it like him. No, and you mentioned Funny Games too, real quick, uh, making a case for it being a horror horror movie. How, how could it not be considered a horror movie? Well, it cannot be considered a horror movie when I don't know when when you're the kind of shithead who thinks that they can decide what is or what isn't because well, I don't know. Well, you know, oddly enough, here's because the thing: some yeah. rock and roll, you know, Rob Zombie guy didn't right, make right. It. Exactly. And the thing is, is that the most exposure that Haneke has had over here is through the horror, the horror community, because Absolutely. because funny games can, you know, it gets it, it's in that shuffle of horror movies, say on Netflix or Amazon or whatever. And it gets, you know, it got over here. You know, I mean, it, people watched it over here because <laughs> or both both versions, really. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, the, the grand irony there or whatever, the, the, the funniest part about all of that is that he went and reshot the whole film, you know, in order to get it played here in America because people wouldn't go and sit through. A, God forbid you have to go and sit through a film and yeah. actually and it has subtitles, you know. So I think he almost went shot for shot. Right, Tom? Like, I mean, it's almost it is shot for shot. Yeah. yeah. And here's the really <laughs> it's bizarre thing. ridiculous, yeah. man. The bizarre no, he, thing. he meticulously recreated even the scenes that he considered flawed and, and frames that had mistakes in them. Right. He yeah. recreated it completely. Yeah, so he's making a comment. He's commenting on the whole, the absurdity of the whole situation, obviously. <laughs> and not only that, but he found, a, a, you know, a, an area over here that resembled the exact same area that he shot funny games over in, in Austria. You know, the house is almost exactly the same, you know, 
yeah, I mean that's it's just it's fuck. You can you can flit around the web and see uh, shot for shot comparisons, and it's pretty hilarious. I mean, it's yeah, it's virtually verbatim. Yeah, yeah, Billy, I'm it's more very intentional. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it it is. It, it's it's certainly uh, it's it's sensational, Billy. Uh, you know the one thing that he does, which I'm sure you're you're you know you find lovely. I mean, this film only has what two hundred cuts in it, over almost yeah. a two two hour period. I think the average length of uh, a shot is like thirty seconds, or or close to it. I mean, this is that's kind of his that's kind of his thing. Always, though. I mean, he always. Uh, I mean, first off, I I would like to take exception with uh, Dave Pace's point of view that this has no contemporaries and neither does Haneke. I thought this drew a lot of parallels between uh, you know this film and The Notebook by Nicholas Sparks. I thought uh, they shared a lot of common uh, you know intellectual. Uh, stimulation. Uh, Bill, you're trying to be funny, style. but I don't think any- what's going on with him today, Joe. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anybody. I haven't seen the Notebook. Is anybody else? I know. He's I thought the Cassavetti son directed the Notebook. That dude, you, you, no one has seen the Notebook, I have they? Dude, no. dude, I have a dick. I've never seen the. I've notebook. never seen the Notebook. <laughs> you have to see your the jo- Notebook. Your joke just fell flat. I think because I, I know I, it's probably funny if you want, if I've seen the movie. <laughs> Billy, come <Yeah>. at us. <laughs> You guys, I'm just telling you, you're going to love it. You should all see it. <laughs> you really, really should. Were you should. subjected to this recently, Billy? I think this was an airplane movie. I think I was. Like, it was one of those where they had the big screen up and you couldn't turn away because the entire cabin had to had to watch it. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm being completely sarcastic, obviously. Uh, the... It's it is so rare to see a movie that is about something like aging and you're like struggling with life as as it's being extinguished and it's not some sappy golden hued you know like the bucket list right, you know like right. there's no you know there's it's just sort of unrelenting you know and the um I mean, the first movie, the first Haneke movie I saw was Caché, mm-hmm. and I thought it was genius. And then, I mean, I I took notice that it was a thriller, but it was obviously by someone who was kind of a master of whatever whatever he was doing sure. there. And then I saw The Piano Teacher, and I was like, I, I can't, I just couldn't believe the camera's always, like, almost perfectly at eye level, uh, <laughs> on sticks, and pans left and right. And that's about it. And if he doesn't even have to pan left and right, he won't do it, you know. And I just the the act of boiling away all of the vernacular of filmmaking into in in basically him throwing down a challenge to himself to say, can I tell this without any trick whatsoever? Can I do that? Can I get away with that? And and, you know, getting away with it like he does is just amazing. He almost does everything like just the opposite of of what what should be done right i mean well he's he's asking what should be done okay like he's saying okay we've we've taken for granted that there's all these uh there's all this um phrasing and and vernacular in the film language of uh a boom shot a dolly shot a a zoom uh tracking uh, all of these things he's he's saying is it necessary and and i i promise you in his head he's taking all of that and and like analyzing, do I need this? Do I need that? And then figuring out how he can get away without any of that, you know? And so he's challenging your, I mean, it's what we talked about with Kubrick. It's challenging your, uh, your way of receiving a movie. How are you accustomed to receiving a movie? You know? And you know, it's funny too, Dave, uh, funny games begins with like that helicopter, like a helicopter shot of a family driving, to their destination. <laughs> exactly. Right? I mean, it's not crazy. crazy. With, the cut, with the cutting room theme song playing? <laughs> the old cutting room theme song. <laughs> but, this yeah. play, but, Joe, this, this place takes, uh, this film takes place uh, in, you know, in, in an apartment the whole time. Pretty much, yeah. And, except and, for the um, the concert in the beginning, I think it was the only yeah, other yeah. might be the only other one. That, that's it, and which is a really interesting shot. Like, see, that's the thing about Haneke is that you like the 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 first shot of the film is like an aud- like an audience watching an audience. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just you know you sit there and you're thinking about that, and you're thinking about like you know what what. What does that mean? What is he trying to tell me right here? 
yeah. you know, that an audience is watching an audience. And it could be even vice versa, you know. I and mean, then they clap for you, though, Tom. Yeah, they're clapping. <laughs> yeah. They like you. As I sit there with the gout, yeah, they're clapping and they're, you know. But, Joe, I mean, how fucking interesting is that? Yeah, that shot is really cool, man. I mean, I just I wrote down we're facing uh, an audience. It's almost like um, – we fit we're facing we're the audience and we're facing it's almost like we're facing ourselves we're we're coming in confrontation with ourselves right. which i think to a certain extent i think w- what's happening with the rest of the film here because then the very next thing that happens is someone tried to break into the uh apartment or did break into the apartment or something like that so it's right. like he he's putting us in the position like you know you're gonna be intruding on these people and you know you, you're very con- aware of the fact that you're a, an audience member watching what's about to happen here you know right 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 and that's the, and that's the whole feel you're right joe that's like the where uh, you know where he places the cameras like, you know, yeah, that's right. As if like, we're, we're watching, like we're in that house. Yeah. Well, he just makes you very aware. I mean, it's a, he does it in all his films. He makes you very aware of the act of watching whatever he's going to put in front of you, you know, and that, and that, that's what that shot sort of meant to me. But I do echo uh, Dave's sentiment when we, when we got on here before we even started recording, Tom, Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I feel on very unsteady ground here because you know, the guy, I mean, you can't encapsulize what he's doing or it's just, it's very difficult to try to distill what he's doing or put him in a frame and, uh, you know, uh, analyze it really. And why, and, and it feels almost perverse to try to analyze exactly what he's doing or what he's trying to achieve in his film. So, uh, and, and to not, and, and usually I'll watch like when I'm, when we're going to talk about a director, I'll try to watch as many of the films as, as I can. And, uh-huh. I've seen a lot of his film, almost all of his films that are available, but I've only seen him once and like spread out. So I'm like, dude, how can I get on here and try to talk about this dude's work? Right. With I, I mean, I just you know. Well, just, we're talking. We are talking about Amora Joe. Yeah, one in one in particular for sure. Right. Yeah, but even this one, man. I mean, you know, it's it, it, to me this one actually seems to be his most one of the most straightforward or if not the most straightforward film of his where it's it's purely um you know just a, a really direct film I it, felt. it is Every- kind of about what it's about without trying to sneak around you or anything yeah you're right there's not there's not a you, you're right i mean there's not like this blatant like secret like that goes on in this film like i, I don't know if that's the right word but like ever like like Kodo, like from coda known or benny's video i mean there's just the there's like an agenda there, you know, well, that you're really not aware of. Yeah, and you especially know, especially in hidden, like hidden is just like, yeah. I mean, I, that's Jesus. I mean, that's. I still have no idea what the fuck hidden slash cachet is about. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, how could you? Yeah, but but it's, it's about but really it's scaring genius. the fuck out of you for like two hours. <laughs> yeah. I just like, remember. Why am I so scared? Why am I? So like, yeah, I remember it was like it was recommended to me by Netflix at some point. So you know, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll check this out. And I was like, oh, this is a really good thriller. And then midway through, I'm like, this is amazing. And then at the end, I was like, I have no idea what the fuck just happened. And I was like, I just saw something that was brilliant. Like this was. It's marketed as a thriller, you know, probably the same way Funny Games is marketed as a as a slasher film or whatever, you know. Right. And and, he and ends, then <laughs> yeah, yeah, he ends Cache or Cash uh, with like uh, if if I remember like just a shot of like from across the street of a crowd like, you know, in front of a building. Yeah. Which is just really bizarre. And there's and there's two well the thing is too, there's like the kid, the child of the parents is meeting with uh, this kid from the school that he's like, you've never seen these two characters together. Huh. So there's no context or reason for them to be sitting there having a conversation and then walking away. So at least like, <laughs> what the hell was that all about? You know, yeah. like I, I, I'm, it's on the to-do list to go watch that again and kind of try to analyze it a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I, I found funny games, I mean, somebody had, uh, brought that to my attention like this is like around 2008 i had no idea who this dude was and then i you know i went to town you know after uh i watched funny games and like probably joe did i i kind of just watched i watched most all of them uh and this is before the white ribbon was out i'd watched all of them but not in order you know and i'd only watched them once Uh, i was able to 
watch most of Code Unknown and, and I rewatched the Austrian version of Funny Memes. But Christiana's right, man. I mean, you know, you, you this is this is a dude that like, you know, we, we have to go back and, and really take a look at. He he invites us to. I mean Yeah, he, absolutely. He, he, the, the the films quite clearly are, are challenges that are that are tossed out to us. It's 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 like look you know, watch this and, and get, you know, try and get what I'm what I'm trying to tell you out of this. You, you, you know, clearly with funny games, like funny games is, is blatant and he's come out and said as much. You know, yes. it's like this film is a challenge. Like yeah. the, the the correct moral response to funny games is to walk out of the theater. Right. Right. You, you <laughs> know what I mean? And and yeah. So yeah. He like, said something like wrong? that. Like he was doing his job. But, you know, people will walk out of the theater. Or something well, like that. <laughs> he he has never been shy about stating explicitly that his, you know, he kind of comes. I, I feel like he comes from a school of. Uh, you, this is gonna. This, I, I'm gonna stroke my beard while I say this, Dave. <laughs> uh, I think he comes pretty strictly from a, a school of European thought, which is very critical. Like yeah, Joe is fond of quoting uh, Jean Luc Godard by saying, uh, "The best <laughs> critique of a beard now. Oh, the best critique of is a, of a film is another film." And I, I, you know, Haneke has like very explicitly stated his goal is to uh, challenge and and try to dismantle the Hollywood way of making films. So his films are specifically like a hand grenade thrown right at the Hollywood style of filmmaking, you know, so you don't have to you don't have to like second guess him on that. He's telling you what he's doing, you know. And that's what's so awesome about it. it it's literally it, they're like each each fucking each each one of those movies is like a is like a Sex Pistols track, you know, or like he is really strangely punk rock yeah, under the very, surface. Of, they're very. so calm, but no one is more punk rock in filmmaking right now no, than, no, than Hannah, right. which is crazy. <laughs> and then if you look at him, you know, <laughs> like, I remember when and I then he's that. this. Yeah, this dapper old <laughs> yeah, like a, Austrian like an old gent professor. With, like, you know, that, he is yeah, a professor. Totally. He teaches. He teaches. Yeah, I bet he does. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that's the thing when I saw Funny Games and I was like, you know, the Can you imagine handing in your homework to Professor Haneke? Like, no. fuck, you're fucked. What are you doing? <laughs> Joe, you know, his his, you know, Haneke directing this film, I mean, is obviously challenging because he knows, you know, I mean, the, the whole the whole film takes place in the apartment. Uh, I mean, you, you you've directed, a, you know, a few films yourself. I mean. Like is a setting like that like you know is it something like you know your mouth your mouth could water over or is it just is it extremely challenging? Oh Jesus, Tom! I have... Oh come on, Joe! Just answer the fucking <laughs> like you know just think about well, it. Well, of course, man. I mean, it's so it's it's much easier. Let's put it this way: somebody who has, you know, there, there's no there's a good reason why Hollywood um, does, invented the set pieces. You know, I mean, it it just takes up a lot of slack for you. You know, so when you're putting uh, the hero running through explosions and the Grand Canyon and all this other stuff, I mean, yeah. that's it's exciting enough. So it does have to. I'm not talking about all that crap. I'm just saying. But I'm just saying, yeah. So a, sure, a, like when you filmmaker's when you're, perspective. All right, you're like, I'm telling the story, you know, and. It's got. It's just taking place in in, in just a few rooms. Sure. Like, like, can you, like, can you, I mean, is that like, could that be more exciting because you, it's more challenging and you got to find all these different ways to try to tell the story and keep it interesting, or, or you know, or is it ultimately you know just a, you know a struggle like a bad. Well, it's a cha- it's a challenge and it's very difficult, but. Um... You know, I would say that Haneke's a master of doing right, it, and right. you know what he's able to do, and to keep it to sustain that for. Right. It's like to, something to, he he wants to do. Like he he would probably almost rather do that. So you know, just stay in that one location. Yeah, I think he. You know, I was listening to a couple of these interviews earlier. I think that he he you know he's obviously like any really talented dude is taking the subject matter and building and designing his artwork around the subject. So when you're talking about a very intimate relationship between two older people, it feels right that you're in a very confined area that almost feels uh, claustrophobic. And there's, you know, one area to breathe when he opens the window, you know, like it's very, it's very intimate and quiet and contained. So, you know, it's that form follows function thing where, you know, if you're making a, um, if you, if, if your subject is a very, intense 
uh, exchange between two people on the most intimate of levels. The setting wouldn't be right if, you know, they're traipsing across the country or whatever, you know what I mean? Like in even in hospitals, like see, and that's what that's where, you know, he's so brilliant. Right. But like, he doesn't like as soon as you yeah. open if you open up the set to hospitals and doctors and everything right. else, you start to dilute what's at the heart of the of the film. So the story he's probably started with the story and then just started to realize, well, let me just bring this closer and closer and closer together. You, you, you spend the film in the places that they are comfortable as human beings, right? I mean, the most intimate parts of their lives and the places they feel most comfortable, you know, is a person's kitchen, is a person's living right. room, is right. a person's bedroom. And and by really restraining us to those locations primarily, it's done exactly what Joe said. It's It's created this intimate bond where we spend time with them and we keep seeing the same surroundings. We see the same surroundings that they keep seeing. Yeah, right. you feel very familiar with them. And, I, so it's it amazing. you in sync with them. Right, and going back to like, you know, you know what, what? What we're talking about is, you know, and, and how he's the only guy that can make a movie like this because, like, most filmmakers, they would they would cut to like the daughter at her house talking to her husband about how she feels about exactly. her, you know. And, well, there's the hospital, and he, but l- let me add two things to that because the one of the major motifs, and we sort of touched on it before, like right at the beginning, where where the intruder, it's exactly what he's doing is where the intruders intruding on these people's lives, but so is everybody else in the film. And what what does he do in the last like uh, I don't know if this is a spoiler or not, but uh, he actually does it in the beginning of the movie, so it doesn't matter. He he like seals off the room completely, you know, with tape, so it's like airtight, you know, where the whole film has been a series of invasions from the outside, including us, you know, and a pigeon. <laughs> yeah, and a pigeon, which he traps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oddly enough. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, that, that pigeon is just, oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, even that makes you think, you know? I mean, yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's amazing. I definitely, I mean, I know we, we were talking about this one being his most straightforward, but I, I, did, I, I do sense that there's undercurrents there. I mean, the, the sort of climax of the movie is really friggin' intense, and mm-hmm. there's, you know... I do think there's other stuff floating in the background there beyond just what we're seeing, you know? Um, I mean, it's, it's why you keep going back to his movies to, (laughs) to see the stuff you didn't see the first time, you know? Yeah, it does feel, it does feel like that. You know, I woke up this morning, that whole pigeon sequence is like, and what follows it is kind of, uh, yeah, you kind of go, Hey, something's going on here. Uh, You know, and the funny thing is, uh, the first thing I did when I, uh, (laughs) <laughs> and I did I, when I woke up this morning. I watched it last night, and I went back and I watched the first shot again. Me where, too. I did the same thing. Yeah, because you know, be, what? I wanted to know if they were the focal point of the shot. Like I was so like I I wanted to know if they if you could see that couple in the shot if they were in dead center because I didn't think they were. I thought he was. I thought he was. Oh, oh no no no! I mean the first shot. The first shot actually was um, the bra- the. Uh, Oh, the, the break! Right, yeah, the right, right. Breaking into the house because right. I wanted to know what became of him. You know right. what I mean? What actually okay. became of him? You know what I mean? And he's not there. He's not there. But the window's open, and he yeah. says, "Did you open this window?" And he says, yeah. "No." But then, but also to go back to uh, that intimacy thing, the, the you, you see the piano in the in, the, in that opening shot, but you don't pick up. I didn't pick up on it really. I mean, there's so you know, you're, there's so much going on. You're aware so much, but when he when he finally pants to that piano, like halfway through the film, it's like oh, like it's like a huge plot turn. Like all of a sudden, there's a piano in this pe- exactly. in this people's space, and we've been in the space for an hour, and it's like it's almost as riveting as like an M Night, uh, you know, twist or something like that. Are you, you talking know? about when their their former student comes to the apartment? Right. Yeah. And then all of a That's sudden, a he pants to the he, right. pants, he pants to the piano, and you're like, Jesus Christ! <laughs> you're like, what? That is why. <laughs> right. It's oh great. It's amazing, man. <laughs> what? what so he's suggesting, what well, with that window being open, that he he jumped out the window. I, you know, Tom, I I can't, I won't venture a guess. Actually, I, let's just put it that way. I don't know. I sort I I sort of felt like that this there's morning. There's nothing that that could define what that that you when you rewatched it. There's nothing that really defines what could have happened. Well, I only watched the first shot. You know, I literally watched the first 
30 seconds before the titles or what, uh, before the main title. Do you have any thoughts, Dave? Well, I mean, definitely on the subject of, of oh, shit. You know, it all, at first it almost seems like the intruder is us, right? I mean, that's kind of the obvious thing to, to think about it. Um, but the the open window and the kind of did somebody go out the window? I I don't know, man. And I, I don't even know if it's ultimately. I mean, I'm sure it's ultimately important, but <laughs> I, I I got. I think I, I think I don't need to know. Yeah, yeah. But I don't, I don't feel any personal urge to like, man. I gotta how to figure that out that's yeah crazy. because then you get into like that but territory. you did but joe did he had an urge to figure it out he went back and, and, and well, well I was, yeah he I'm, wanted joe you wanted some closure it's uh, an open question when you watch the movie yeah. and you kind of go back and you go hey wait why did yeah and 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 i don't know like i i thought maybe like i thought maybe it explained like like why the cops had to like smash the doors in Right. You, you know, like it explained like like why he had to have that dramatic moment mm. with the cops coming and bashing the doors in as opposed to just like why? Because somebody would easily say, like, why wouldn't the landlord just come up, open the friggin' door when they noticed the you know, the smell. Right. And do something about it. Instead, it's this like dramatic, you know, police bashing the doors in. And I think to set that up, to justify that to himself, he had to go, well better make this little break-in subplot right yeah well and, and i think that just ties off that little loose end for him you know yeah i mean well the real point here is that his uh, what, what by us doing what we're doing and looking into it deeper and deeper is exactly what he intended so it yeah, does, sure, ultimately sure. it doesn't matter what it means to like maybe it does or whatever but what's what's really the star here is the omission right the things that he yeah, I know that this might sound like a cliche, I think, but the things that like he's not he's taking out of the out of the story, you know what I mean? The, so yeah, he right. he offers us a, a gestalt look at it where we 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 put together the the finishing pieces of the puzzle, you know what I mean? And that's really what the point is, you know, ultimately, other than the emotional impact of what's happening on the screen. Well, yeah, and and the success of that kind of proves that that like like I don't know that I think pretty much anybody could could hopefully watch this and and get pulled in. And if you don't, fuck you. You you have no imagination, you philistine. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking Michael Haneke. We're talking Amor. Uh, Billy, do you have any uh, any other thoughts about Amor? Uh, none. I I you know it's the it's the old Kubrick. Or problem. any thoughts on how to get? Yeah, there's too much. <laughs> this is like go watch the movie, you know. But the um yeah I I I just am always very excited about his movies right. because the it really is the things that he's not doing and he's responding. You know, it's just nice to watch a movie that someone has thought out all the things they don't have to do to make a story and it just activates your brain. You know, you become so much more involved and, and, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. I'm also really curious if that, that whole apartment had to be a set, but it is an amazing set because it looks so much like a real apartment. Right. Yeah. And I was, the lighting is so simple. You think it's a set? So you really, it, you is. Think it's, it is. It is. Huh? Yeah. 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 It's got to be. the windows are green screen. Attention. Yeah. Like really? It's, yeah. yeah, man. Wow. Yeah. I was paying attention to the, the angles and there were definitely, in order to get some of the shot, a bunch of the shots, you had to have false walls and mm. stuff like that. And the, um, the other thing that I really noticed in this one is just what a brilliant sound designer uh, he he either works with or he is because the the main sound in this movie is silence and uh, the silence is punctuated by creaks in the floorboards and breathing in bed at night and you know running water and it's just uh, I mean probably not since Bergman has there been a guy who uses sound so well in such you know wow. Spartan circumstances that's, yeah, so. That's, that's Listen, listen as much as watch when you see this movie. It's, it's and amazing. with the and the same definitely goes for the rest of his films. Really, I mean, on the sound design front, Cachet in particular, you know, there's no score, there's no background music, nothing. there's no yeah, nothing. <laughs> the whole film, yeah, and you don't even notice if 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 you didn't like if nobody told me before I said I'm watching, I wouldn't have noticed. Yeah, I mean, there's a shot in Funny Games where like he just comes, you know, like he just cuts to like the exterior of the house, and you just hear like the crickets and frogs. 
for like two minutes. <laughs> like, and you just, you're just <laughs> held out there and you don't hear what's going on inside. And you know, there's this absolute, you know, horror and torture going on in there. And then you're just like left to think about it from outside the house. Yeah. For like yeah. 60 seconds or so. It's, <laughs> it is, man. I mean, but it, it's the, it's denying the orgasm. That's what it is. And that that, <laughs> that film is all about denying the orgasm, uh, and then ask, and then asking you what sick porn you're getting off of, <laughs> telling you it's a problem. That's what Funny Games is all about. Joe, any thoughts on Haneke or uh, Amor before we move on tonight? Oh, uh, not really, man. I, I mean, I was surprised that we didn't get in. You know, the guy's such a film. Uh, you know great filmmaker there's plenty to talk about with the filmmaking itself but mm-hmm. um usually these sort of conversations on the cutting room go toward you know how do you feel about death and dying but or have you ever seen anyone die oh. like this and all oh, that we're stuff. Maxless tonight. i know max is in here so i guess we could forget oh, because he, he would honestly it's so great that you say that joe because he would be I know. especially with you he'd be like like with you and your wife and when you get to that i know lay it all I, out it's funny because i was sure it was going to turn that way but um, I guess just just see our or no, it's more cat. academic tonight. Joe. How 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 about this, Tom? Uh, you're you're the death phobe. What's the what's the fear of death? What's the what's the phobia? My biggest phobia of how, like as far as no 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 the the fear of death. I'm sure there's a phobia named something in regards to it. But uh, you don't like movies about death. You don't like confronting death. How how was this one for oh, you? Oh, I I I had no problem. Was your skin crawling? No, I had no problem with this. I mean, the only personal, uh, you know, the only thing, uh, the only way it affected me personally was I, I watched my grandmother die, like, in-house. And mm. it was somewhat of my responsibility to, like, take care of her during the day, like, during the last two or three months of her life. And it kind of, I kind of had those thoughts uh, where I remember just, like, looking like, I mean, just seeing death, like, you know, you just see it and, you know, wh- while the person's still alive and it's torture and you don't want them to go through that, you know. And again, you know, as we see this couple, you know, go through it uh, and, and how it affects the husband in particular. Uh, it's I mean, it's maddening, Billy. You know, I mean, it's, it's I think that this movie is m- more about how one is affected by someone else's death than, than really their own. Mm. So I didn't, I, yeah, go I, I think it is about that, Tom, but I also think it's about the humiliation of, you know, the infirm and, and dying and old age and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just yeah. the humiliation is just the worst friggin' part of it, man. Right. Yeah. The, the pity, it. right. Every time that, oh, every time people would pity her, yeah, because oh. she doesn't want that, you know. And that that's... look on her yeah. face, man, it would kill you. It yeah. just it was like and because how fight. sincere is the pity, or is the pity just a, is it programmed? You know, is oh. it just is it just an emotion that we go through because we feel that we have to go through? When know? her student pities her and writes her that 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 postcard, oh my god, it was terrible. That was terrible. I know. It's just it's just so it's so it rings so true though because. The situation, we have no, there's no practical or, you know, everyday way situation like that, you know. So when you're you're put in that situation, and God, I mean, we're all going to be put in it one way or another from from the uh, dying end. But when when you're put in it from, you know, the grieving end, it's just... You do feel terrible, but when you when you express your sympathy, like what can you say? You know what I mean? Like what can you say? That's not that's right. You know that doesn't sound false. You know, right. it's, it's, right. freaking, it's the worst. Some of the most interesting things in the movie, like acting wise and dialogue wise, are just it kind of you know comes out of the eyes wide shut conversation that we were having about how how couples interact with each other and obviously like eyes wide shut is all sex and jealousy and romance and all that it's the sort of youthful problems of a relationship and this deals explicitly with the demise of of all your you know all your pride and jealousy and dignity and the way they like the subtle back and forth that starts happening between them where resentment builds up and and frustration and alienation and all these things and you know her pride continues even despite her, her state and their 
it's like they never really outright bicker, but it always is there under the surface, Absolutely. you know, like as they're struggling to figure like they've never been through this before. They're figuring out at the last minute on the fly how to deal with this situation, you know, and, and they never outright reconcile anything either. No, there's no, there's no, there's no glowy golden resolution to how to deal like, with there's it. There's no you know? like, and I love you. The end. Like that never happens. Sorry, sorry, yeah. fuckers, Philistines who haven't seen this. <laughs> <laughs> but that never, this shit never happens. And it's amazing. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. It's amazing that you've used the word Philistine three times tonight, Dave. I know, it's awesome. I'll be honest with you. Uh, hey, guys, we're going to uh, begin to, to wrap up this uh, review on more. And, you know, I'll, I will say this, Joe. Haneke someone we have to revisit again. Well, guys, I guess we're all in agreement that uh, Michael Haneke's a treasure. Amor is a treasure. I mean, this is something people should go out and see, right? Absolutely. Hell yeah. Anybody have the balls to say no here, Dave? No, you fucking crazy. <laughs> All right, that wraps up a more. We're going to be moving on to our classic review theme. I do have a very special uh, surprise for everyone before we talk to Malcolm Denary, and I'm going to bring that uh, special surprise in in just a second. 